Thank you very much. Any questions? All right. All right, great. So my name is Stephen Blofarb. I'm, I'm a physicist. Uh, I uh, and as a physicist in particle physics, uh, I'm quite acquainted with uh, computing. We do a lot of coding. But I'm not going to talk to you about coding here. I'm going to talk to you uh, very simply about our universe um, and about what we're trying to do at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, what we've been doing and what we plan to be doing for several years. Uh, I uh, started, when I first made this, I called this missing pieces, as if we were looking for missing pieces of the, uh, of the universe. But in fact, uh, I think the universe is there, and there's just some things in the universe that are hidden, and we have to try to find them. And in fact, it turns out it's most of the universe. So we're going to get to that. Now, first of all, I'd like to just make sure this is clear, because I come from a third world country across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so this talk will actually have facts in it. Um, if any of you want lies or just, you know, some just discussion, we can have a cup of coffee uh, at the break. <laughs> So I want to show you a seminar uh, that uh, I was very fortunate to attend. Uh, it's happened in 2012 on July 4th, uh, and this was a scientific seminar. We do these periodically. Uh, the experiments, there are four major experiments on the Large Hadron Collider. There's many different experiments at CERN. The LHC is not all there is at CERN. Uh, it's a European laboratory for particle physics, and there's a lot of work on a variety of things, from antimatter and neutrinos to, to the LHC. Uh, and uh, we were just presenting each other our results, but you can see there was a lot of interest in this one. Um, and it was a very technical talk. I just want to show you, give you an idea. I'm not going to give you any quizzes on what's in the class, but this is, these are the kind of slides that were being shown. Uh, I think perhaps the most interesting number uh, that I see on this is this one up here. This is, this is slide number 106. <laughs> Out of 116, this is the slide of Joe Incandela, who's a spokesperson for the CMS experiment at CERN. Uh, and uh, these are the beautiful, beautiful slides. I mean, who could come up with a color scheme like that? Um, or the choice of Comic Sans uh, font. Uh, this was my uh, spokesperson at the time on the Atlas experiment, uh, Fabiola Gianotti, who's now the director general of, of CERN. Uh, and it's lovely, and here what you see is the conclusion, which got people in tears and, and jumping up and down, uh, is 5.0 times the Greek letter sigma. That got us very, very excited. Um, in fact, the following days, uh, there were articles written the following week, uh, including, I don't know if you can see up here, this is Auto World. Uh, we don't usually have our results presented in Auto World. I don't know why. You think they'd be interested, uh, but everything, and even the cover of uh, the Economist later on, but pretty much uh, all newspapers are covering international news had a picture of uh, detectors or or an event on it. The, the picture at the top there, I happened to be in Melbourne, Australia at the time for our conference, and um, you can see there that the full front page of, of the Guardian there had an event display on it, something showing uh, particles colliding. Um, and during that week, one billion people, that's a pretty big number, a billion people around the globe saw video from those slides you saw there before. It was an hour and a half seminar. So a billion people got to see Comic Sans uh, that day. Um, so it leads you to wonder, um, you know, why? Why on earth were people around the globe interested by this? So to really understand it, I'd like to go back to our, our previous seminar that had happened um, much earlier. Uh, this is the famous uh, uh, particle physicist Odd, who's there, over there. And um, she's presenting the work of her uh, graduate student, Zog. And Zog had just started our field at the time. It was very exciting for us. He was um, smashing things together, which is still what we do to try to understand what's inside. Uh, and at the time, he was finding out that rocks are made up of smaller rocks, right? smaller rocks, and uh, that was very important. It was groundbreaking. Um, <laughs> got our fuel going. Um, the thing is, human human beings, we have big questions. Back then, we had big questions. Now, we have big questions. The questions get maybe more detailed, <clears throat> but they're equally as big as they ever were. Where do we come from? Uh, what are we made out of? Uh, what's our destiny, where are we heading to? Um, what are the rules? Are, are there rules behind all of this that we're seeing? 
And uh, is, there, is there anything else out there uh, that we don't see uh, that will help give us a better uh, glimpse of this? So we have a variety of different tools over the years that we've used to try to investigate this. The one that probably got us the furthest, uh, and we still use today, uh, it has a very high level of precision, is, is this thing. Uh, the, the human eye, it's an amazing, amazing device. And this is where we did many, many of our observations. Um, the, uh, the human eye can resolve uh, human hair. This is my friend Eva, my colleague Eva, I should say. She works in communication at CERN. And uh, if you take a look very closely, you can get to um, uh, tens of microns of precision with your own eye without any other device on there. If she'll let me get that close, you, you, know, you can make that measurement. Um, alternatively, so that's looking in pretty close, you can get a pretty good, um, pretty good precision. If you look far away, we can see things which are uh, two and a half million light years away with our bare eyes. This is uh, Andromeda uh, out there, uh, which is actually coming towards us, but I don't want to worry you about that. Um, so we're happy with that, right? I mean, you can do a huge amount of, of physics, you can do a huge amount of science uh, seeing that, and you can learn a lot about the world with just the human eye. Um, but no, the human beings are never, never happy. We want to know more, we want to answer the big questions. And so we forever are looking out to see what's out there. Now, I do a lot of uh, education and outreach uh, on my experiment. I guess I've probably gotten too old to write good code. Uh, and, but this is very enjoyable. I get to um, meet people from all around the globe. We had something like 135,000 people actually come on site to visit, most of them students, high school students. In this case, I also set up a, a system uh, in our control room where we can talk to students uh, in their classroom. And in this case, I was with my friend Dave Barney. He's actually uh, from the CMS experiment, but we're good friends. We, were, we live across the street from each other. And uh, we uh, both hung out together to celebrate the Higgs boson because the two experiments had discovered uh, that together. We, I asked him to come join me. Uh, you can see our control room in the background. On the other side, we had some students uh, in a classroom uh, from Alaska, actually, at the time. And so you can see it's just sort of dark on the two sides. It was evening where we were, but it was morning. I think it's always dark in Alaska, as far as I know. Um, and this young boy there, uh, wearing the Netflix and chill t-shirt in the front, he um, didn't know what his shirt meant, but he, uh, <clears throat> he uh, gets and just asked me this simple question, uh, which to this day I'm still thinking about. How, how do we measure what we can't see? Now, at the, at the time, you know, I talked to him a little bit. You know how it is, you, you never say the right things. Um, but I tried uh, to answer him, talk to him about dark matter and things like this, but then I realized deep inside that that's probably one of the most profound questions that we ask. That sums up science. Science is trying to measure what we can't see. We use a couple different methods for this. One of them is we try to see more, we try to explore. So we went beyond our eyes and built devices that can help our eyes, so telescopes or, or microscopes. And we also went places, we voyaged all over the place to try to, to, to learn more about <coughs> excuse me, our world and our universe. But in addition, we also thought about things. What, from what we saw, we tried to extrapolate and say, you know, make an, an understanding that's bigger than just the things that we see. Uh, these are basically experimentalists uh, and theorists. Uh, like myself, my pants are soaked because I didn't predict as a theorist well, that it was going to rain, but I measured it very well this morning. Um, so uh, it's interesting about this to see the play back and forth. Um, there's some, I don't know if you look at social media these days, if you do stop, it's not worth it, but um, there's you know, people out there putting everything out there, some of them are flat earth people. I thought that was done with some time ago. <laughs> Um, so several thousand years ago, a guy named Eratosthenes over there, he measured uh, the circumference of our planet. It wasn't just, is it round? Uh, we knew that well before that. I mean, we saw lunar eclipses, we saw the shadow of the Earth. Uh, you know, we knew it was round. Uh, but this guy, he, uh, he traveled, he was, he was a Greek who was working in uh, Alexandria at the time, and he used to travel south along the river. 
And he knew a certain how far it was to go to this one village. And in that village, they had told him, you know, if you look down this well uh, at noon, you can see the sun on this particular day. It's the solstice. So, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. That means that the the um, the sun is directly overhead, and that means uh, we can make a measurement. So he got us out his iPhone and he called his friend up in Alexandria and he said, you know. Get a pole out and measure the shadow of that pole. I know how far it is from here to there. You can triangulate and we can calculate the circumference of our planet. And they did, and they got up to within a few percent, depending on the accuracy of a stud at the time. It could be 1% or it could be you know, several percent. But anyway, they got the circumference now. If this guy traveling on these ships, uh, when he set out to sail from Portugal west, uh, had read those things, which had happened 2,000 years ahead of time, he would have packed more provisions to try to make his way over to, uh, to Asia, to India. Uh, but he got lucky and ran into something uh, on the way there. But you can see there's always a play between the two, reading what's, what's, what's going on, and, and then making, making prediction from what's made measured. And this is what we do in particle physics today. We, we, we make measurements and then we, we try to figure out from that. There was another great philosopher who, who wrote about this, um, uh, George Harrison, who basically uh, said, the fool on the hill sees the sun going down, and the eyes of his head sees the world spinning around. Great words from a great philosopher. Uh, same thing as Eratosthenes. He was a few thousand years after Eratosthenes, but hey, he learned it. So what have we learned so far? If we're looking out uh, into the distance over the past several centuries, we've made tremendous progress from the very first telescopes, uh, Galileo here, who allowed us to see that there were moons around uh, Jupiter. There wasn't just Jupiter, a bright dot out there, but there was structure. Um, to even better, beautiful telescopes like the Hubble, which allows us to see all the, the billions of galaxies that are out there in, in addition to the one uh, that, we, that we have here in love. And we've been learned how to go beyond looking at things. So you might not know about this experiment. Have any of you heard of LIGO or Virgo? Okay, you have heard about this. Okay. You're nerdier than I thought. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I actually just had that last week. I, I was lucky and uh, I went down to uh, Pisa where there's another component of this called Virgo down there. And it looks very similar to this. This is actually a device that listens to the universe. So along these, these arms, uh, there are mirrors, precision mirrors. And uh, they use the interference of laser light, which is shined down and comes back uh, to the central point, uh, to see if the length of either of those arms changes by a fraction of an atom, okay? <laughs> a very, very angstroms they're measuring here. Did it change by that much? And the idea of that was to try to test a theory that was proposed 100 years beforehand. Uh, uh, general relativity by Albert Einstein to see if space-time itself would would change if there was some big event that involved gravity. And indeed, they, they measured uh, this event here. Uh, this is their, their first major measurement was of uh, two black holes that had uh, uh, collided with each other uh, a few billion years beforehand. And then since then, they've measured a lot of other uh, very interesting phenomena in their measurements. So we've learned really how to look out in the distance and to learn uh, about uh, what's out there in space. Looking in, we've had a variety of different devices from the early microscopes. They allowed us to see that there's structure inside us. This, this is a human hair. Um, and uh, you know, then we learned how to use things other than light. We've used electrons to make more precise measurements. And, um, and now the devices that we use, the equivalents of microscopes now, are the things that we work on at the LHC, so colliding on using protons, getting to higher energy. Uh, higher energy uh, get, allows you to go to smaller wavelengths, and it allows you to make uh, precise measurements. And this is an image of a collision in an experiment. I work for the Atlas experiment, which is one of the four experiments on the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So we've, we've gone quite a ways in looking out and, and in looking in. Uh, and we've learned quite a bit, you know, looking out, uh, we basically learned, you know, we're this one small blue dot out there in a, in a beautiful system around a star, which is one of 100 billion stars in the galaxy, which is one of 100 billion galaxies out there in the universe. 
And uh, we've also learned, in addition to learning the distances where things are and how vast uh, space, how vast the universe is, um, we've also learned about time, how things have expanded since the beginning of time. Extrapolating from the motions of galaxies and clusters of galaxies, we can go back in time uh, and figured out that our age is something like 13.8 uh, billion years, uh, which you guys all know from the song of Big Bang Theory. I won't sing for you. Um, you go, we go back in time then. Also, at the, at the very uh, early universe, there was a very rapid expansion, which we don't really understand completely, but it gave us the back, microwave background radiation. <clears throat> when, when you had, at that time, you were seeing uh, the electrons starting to form around uh, nuclei. But we have some idea of this and um, the evolution that we're going through. So we're still trying to answer that question, where do we come from and where are we going? We also see that our universe is expanding, uh, and not just at a, at a constant rate, but it's accelerating its expansion, which is something we don't yet know how to explain. So we've learned quite a bit about uh, our universe. And, uh, and in looking in, we've learned, of course, about ourselves, what we're made out of, basic components. Uh, we, we got through the microscopes to learning about cells, cells from molecules, molecules are made out of atoms, and we've even gone inside of atoms uh, and learned, oops, first one button, uh, and learned that uh, at the very center there, the protons and neutrons that make up the, the nucleus, they themselves have structure, uh, and these are quarks, which are held together by gluons, and this is where we're at right now. And we actually have this feeling that we've reached the limit, that these are fundamental particles. But I always hate to say that without noting that many, many times in history, human beings have said that. So we don't stop trying to measure that. We do look to see if quarks, for example, have structure. But there's a lot of evidence indicating that they don't, that they are fundamental. When I say a fundamental particle, what I mean is something which has no volume to it. It has no structure to it. It's just a point. And at that point, uh, you have properties associated with it, such as mass and charge, and they seem to be intrinsic properties. Uh, what we've done is map them all out, and we see that we have these nice, uh, much like the periodic table of the, of the elements, you see that we've, we've figured out exactly what's there, what are the particles which make up matter, they're the ones on the left-hand side, that's the, the quarks and, and the leptons, and then there's these particles that carry the forces over there on the right, which are, which are the bosons. But what's interesting about this, we ourselves, we're made up primarily, or actually entirely, of this up quark and the down quark on the upper left, and electrons. We don't need those other things. We don't know why they're there. We have to produce them uh, in the laboratory to see them. Or Mother Nature does that for us with cosmic rays, so charged particles coming from the sun or other sources out in space, hit our upper atmosphere and make interactions, produce some of those particles, which we then measure. This is where we first learned about this. Rudolf Hess did a lot of this work in Innsbruck. Well, so many of those things over there we've had to produce or, or have been produced, but they disappear. Things which have higher mass decay to things which have lower mass. Okay, so you can easily go from M, C, MC squared to E. That happens all the time. Okay, so, so things with higher mass become things which have lower mass. But when you get to the lightest things, they just sit there. You have to add energy to them to produce something else. So that's us. We're this up quark, down quark, and the electron. So there's these, you know, we characterize these according to mass. You have these three families. Um, electrons were fine. We didn't need muons. Uh, maybe or maybe not. So some ideas that maybe muons have helped us to evolve. But messing with our, our DNA. Um, but these are just things which are out there in space that we're seeing and that we're measuring. Um, but it, it does make you wonder why. You know, what's with this? Why, why are these particles have different masses? Why is it the exact same thing in different families with bigger masses? Um, so basically it's this big question we had. And we had that going into the construction of the LHC. It was one of the things driving us uh, to build a large hadron collider. What is this thing called mass? Uh, this gentleman here, uh, Peter Higgs, he and several others, Francois Anglaire, Robert Bruth among them, uh, they looked into this and tried to come up with an idea of what would give things mass. 
And all the, all the theories were great, perfectly symmetric, if mass was zero, if there was no mass. Everything was, was just fine back then. Uh, but then we started to find out that that existed, and it's there, and it's intrinsic. And we started finding out that the force carrying particles had mass. Nothing could account for that. Uh, so uh, these brilliant minds came up with an idea that, in fact, at the very beginning of time, there was some sort of symmetry that was broken. And a field appeared everywhere. Uh, this field, this is a rough, you know, illustration of it, but essentially, there's a field everywhere. Uh, even under your chair, behind your fridge, there's a field everywhere in the universe. It's uniform, and when a particle, when a fundamental particle interacts with it, it gets mass. And this is how it gets mass. Uh, the more mass the particle has, that means it's the more that it interacts with that field. That's what gives it that mass. And even the Higgs boson itself gets its mass by interacting with its field. Um, so this is, this is what they proposed. This was, uh, let me see when this was, 1964 was when this was proposed. Uh, and uh, so then we got to work. They also, by the way, they told us, you know, don't bother trying to figure this out or to find it because that field corresponds to a particle. You guys all know quantum field theory, of course. When you have, when you have a field, you have a particle. When you have a particle, you have a field that's associated with it. It's a duality that we found in quantum mechanics. So if they say there's this field, a uniform field, force field, that means there's what we call a boson. A boson just means the kind of statistics that it behaves by. Uh, there's a particle, the propagator of that field. Uh, it's like an excitation of the field. And so, you know, they told us don't bother looking for it. Uh, we don't have any idea what the mass of that particle will be. There's nothing that allows you to predict it. And also it interacts so weakly with matter that you have no chance of doing it. So we decided to set out and try to find it. Uh, totally normal human behavior, right? <clears throat> and we built this device. Uh, you may be seen images of it. This is a large hadron collider. It's, it's uh, roughly 100 meters underground uh, in the, um, I can show you where, where it is, beautiful uh, countryside here. I'm very fortunate to live over there. Uh, this is near Geneva. That's the Geneva airport. <clears throat> the, uh, the accelerator is all underground, um, primarily because there's no way we could afford the property above ground. Uh, it's, it's very, very expensive here. Everything's underground. Uh, it's also stable down there, prevents a lot of cosmic rays from getting inside. Um, the laboratory CERN is over close to where the experiment I work on is, Atlas. It's this little triangle there is the primary laboratory for CERN. And if you do come to Geneva, you should come to visit. Uh, and you can see the other experiments. Those four places there, Alice, CMS, LHCB, and Atlas, <coughs> those are places where we collide protons together. So the idea of the LHC is you take protons and you zap them around one direction, around the other direction as well. You use superconducting magnets uh, in order to get a very high magnetic field without using all the electricity that exists uh, to do that. And, and then you just simply pass the beams through each other. You, we do cross the beams. You know, they, they tell you not to in the Ghostbusters, but we do. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the probability of collision is very, very low, but we have very, very intense beams when we do this. So something like, roughly at the moment, 40 million uh, bunches of, of protons pass through each other each second. 40 million per second. A bunch is 100 million you know, galaxy of protons. Uh, that we squeeze together. And when we get that, a couple of these 100 billion versus 100 billion, we get roughly 25, 30, 40 collisions, right, if we're lucky. And uh, that's, that's the game you have to play, but we learned how to do that. <clears throat> we surround these points where there are the collisions with these detectors. Um, the uh, ATLAS and CMS experiments are very general purpose, they're the largest. We have each over 5,000 people working on our experiments. Uh, 3,000 people sign our papers. Every one of our papers has, has our, our, our names on it. Uh, the other experiments are more specific, LHCB and ALICE. ALICE is trying to understand the early universe more by looking at um, quark gluon plasma. LHCB is trying to understand the imbalance of the universe, the fact that there's matter and antimatter. They're focused on these problems. But we're, ALICE and CMS are two general ones, and we're the ones that presented to each other the, the Higgs boson. 
This is what we saw uh, when we came on after, after a couple of years, we gathered lots of images like this. Um, we don't look image by image when you have 40 million per second. It's kind of a big job to do. That's why we do use this thing called computing. Uh, we, we devised something called the, the LHC Computing Grid Project, which allows us to distribute the computing worldwide. It was really the first time CERN said, there is no way that we can do this centrally. It has to be distributed. And so we have a, a, a sort of a tier-based system that does the, the computing. And we process collisions and look at the properties of those collisions. You make selections. I want to look at certain types of collisions. We write in Python. Uh, physicists are writing Python, asking, you know, I would like to look at all the collisions. Uh, they have two electrons and some missing energy or something like this. And then we send that to uh, our tiered centers around the globe to get processed and send us back the results. Um, and I'll go, I can go into detail over a coffee if you want about, about that. I want to get to the physics here. This is what we saw when we put together our histograms that got us very excited. This is what Fabiola and Joe were presenting uh, during a conference. We saw these bumps. So essentially what we do is we, we model, we simulate, we look at what we know, what is what what would the world give us without the Higgs boson, is what the background is. And uh, at that time, this is just a very early box. Now we have really big, beautiful uh, bumps uh, that go outside of what you would expect to see without the Higgs boson. And, uh, and we can see, so essentially at 125 GEV, we saw these deviations that told us that we had found the Higgs boson. Uh, now we have many, many sigma, well beyond five sigma, and we're uh, in the process of doing precise measurements. But this, at that moment, allowed us to um, pop that little Higgs up there. It's a special boson. It doesn't have a direction. It's a scalar boson, which is a very interesting thing for us. It means its spin is zero. Uh, so it's, it's everywhere and doesn't, you know, unlike gravity, which has a direction to it, or charge, which has a direction, you know, things are attracted to each other. The Higgs field, the scalar, it's everywhere. Uh, and we can put it on our coffee cups and our t-shirts and our ties. Um, the truth is we had it on there before. So I'm not going to say, oh, now we found it, let's pop it up in our theory. Because nothing made sense unless we had come up with it. So up from the 60s onward, we had t-shirts and coffee cups with it on it. We just hadn't seen it yet. Uh, and it was only at this time that we could proudly drink coffee out of these coffee cups. So we, we were right. But there's still some things we don't know. Um, as as, how am I doing for time? Because I don't have any... Is it? Is there a clock? Okay, okay, very good. Lots of time. I'll tell you some jokes after. Um, what we still don't know. So we're back, this is a, the major questions, uh, this major question here. Uh, where do we come from? Where are we going? Um, we don't understand this expansion, the acceleration of our expansion. Uh, can you imagine? We're getting, we're getting larger and larger. The universe is the universe itself that's expanded. And um, for that to happen, it, it means there has to be some sort of energy uh, in the universe that's pulling it apart. We just don't have a clue. There's a lot of theorists making papers to try to explain dark energy. This, this process, there's no clue. Uh, why do we exist? So 13.8 billion years ago, uh, we had this big bang. Everything that we see in the laboratory tells us that you get equal amounts of matter and antimatter out when that happens. Antimatter is essentially exactly the same as matter. It has an opposite charge to it. And that's what we see when we produce certain neutral particles. When they decay, you get matter, you get antimony, you get electron and positron, muon, antimuon. Um, this is what happened at the Big Bang. And all these particles that came out, and they ran into each other, and they annihilated. When you, when you bring a particle and its antiparticle together, they annihilate and give you a large amount of energy. And that happened. And pretty much everything disappeared. But a little bit of dust remained. And that's us. And we don't know why. Why are we here? We're matter. We do not see anti-galaxies out there. There's no sources of it. You can look for that, but you know that there would have to be a place where they met, you know, antimatter was bordering with matter, and you'd see very high energy gamma rays coming from that. And we don't see that. We we're scanning everywhere. We do not see uh, that this antimatter exists anymore. We don't understand that imbalance. 
We know that for certain particles, it is possible for them to decay and give us a little bit more matter than antimatter. It's the B corp, that's what LHCb is working on, but not at this level. So we don't know why we exist. Um, what are we made of? We're still looking into this. Are, is it Russian dolls, you know, all the way through, uh, or, or, or not? As I said before, we were pretty convinced that the core the electron, these, these, this table I put up there is it, um, but we still look for it. We have to. We have to explore that. You can't just trust it. We have to look into it. And the very fact that there's three, those makes me wonder that uh, there must be some structure in there somewhere. So I, that's my own personal bias, but I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> Another big question is why is gravity so weak? Now this morning when you got out of bed, you felt it was pretty strong, probably. Um, but uh, gravity is extraordinarily weak compared to the other forces. I sort of put orders of magnitude of the forces up there. It depends on your scale, how close things are to each other. But if you go down to sort of the scale of the quarks and gluons, uh, if, if we set electromagnetism to be one, so magnets, the strong nuclear force, the thing that holds together protons, uh, is, is much stronger, but it's much stronger, 60. For a physicist, that's nothing. <laughs> it's stronger. Couple order, order magnitude, couple orders of magnitude. Uh, the weak nuclear force, the, the, the heat we get from the sun, nuclear fission, um, that's a bit weaker. 10 to the minus 4 is 1 10,000. Okay, we, we understand that, but we can actually make a theory that includes that, that as you get to, um, as you go back in time, or you go to higher energy, you'll see that the strength of these forces converge on each other. And so we've actually, the theory we have now includes those three forces. It includes them all together. We were able to reconcile them and see uh, that, in fact, that electro, we have an electroweak theory, we call it. Um, gravity, we have no clue. 10 to the minus 41. It's a huge, huge difference. I mean, if you take two electrons and try to bring them together, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have negative charge, right? So you guys know they're going to push against each other from the electromagnetism. And yet, they also have mass, so they should pull together. And the difference, you know, in strength of these forces was a million, 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 million times. And so we have not come up with any theory uh, yet that fits that into it. There's some different ideas out there that mathematically look nice, but we have no data to indicate how to solve that problem. One of the ideas that came out uh, before the LHC came on, uh, it's an idea that, that, in fact, we are simple electromagnetic beings and we're living on this three-dimensional manifold in a four-dimensional space. There's much more space out there. There's other dimensions, at least one other dimension. And the gravity knows about that. So we're only seeing a residual part of gravity. We're only seeing a small part of gravity uh, just because we're simple electromagnetic things. Um, it's a very interesting idea, and they propose we, you know, anybody can have ideas, but we pay attention to it when they tell us what to look for. And so the theorists said, you know, you need to look uh, for specifically for events that have traps coming out, much like a black hole. So they called it a, a, a micro black hole. And that was a great thing for the LHC, because suddenly we were going to produce black holes, and when that got out to the media, uh, everybody tended to pay attention when we turned on. Um, it's great. The energy of the LHC, just to give you an idea, is this. When two protons collide, that's the energy. It's really not enough to make an earthquake uh, in Nepal. Uh, it's not enough to bring down an airplane. It's a very, very small amount of energy. And it's not going to make a black hole that swallows the Earth. It can't. It can make an instantaneous black hole that exists for a second, shoots out a bunch of traps symmetrically, and disappears. That's their idea, what would happen. Um, <clears throat> we also know from uh, measurements of these cosmic rays, you can measure how much we get bombarded in our upper atmosphere uh, by charged particles. Uh, and this happens at very high energy, higher energies that we can produce. Uh, the LHC that we're doing underground in a controlled environment where we, where we make the collisions so we can measure them has been done by Mother Nature roughly 10,000 times. Uh, already. It's already happened. We just weren't around. We didn't take our detectors and, and measure these, these cosmic rays. So we're pretty sure that those, you know, whatever we produce, we're going to be able to, to measure, and it's not going to have a higher energy than this. We've never learned how to produce more uh, than we put in. By the way, people say, so this is, is you're reproducing the Big Bang? 
that doesn't, that's not right. You know, Big Bang has a lot of energy. Uh, what, what the media forget to write in there carefully is that we're producing the conditions. And so what we're doing is, is by squeezing the beams and bringing them together, we're, we're creating um, the energy density uh, that you had just after the Big Bang, which is a big different from energy. Well, it'd be really hard for us to go get all the stars and bring them together again. Uh, <laughs> Of course, we think about it. <laughs> There's proposals, and, uh, but but you know, but we can make the energy density. So it says to, to think about that. You know, instead of just doing that, take a take a thumbtack and put it here, and another thumbtack put it here, and then do that. You'll feel the difference between energy and energy density. Um, I don't actually don't do that at home. Don't, I don't want to be blamed for that. <laughs> um, and then finally, one of the, the last questions that came up here is is this um, galaxies are great. There's a very bright astronomer. Here she is. Her, her name is Vera Rubin. Uh, she, she left us uh, two years ago. Uh, she was a brilliant uh, astronomer who, who decided she would uh, follow up on the work of a guy named Zwicky who was looking at the motion of clusters of galaxies. And, and he thought, there's something strange here. There's something that's not being accounted for in the motion. So she said, OK, I, I got an idea. Uh, the, what's holding galaxies together is simply gravity. It's the same thing as, as a solar system. You know from school, if you look at a solar system, uh, how the motion of the planets are. The, the planets that are closer to the sun uh, move more quickly. The ones on the outside move more slowly. And you can calculate that ever since Newton. You could calculate what you expect the orbits to be pretty precisely until you get to you know uh, uh, gravity and, and relativity, uh, which is a very, very tiny effect, essentially. It's right there. You can measure that. You can predict it. So you can do the same thing for a galaxy. It's got a center of mass, and things are rotating around that center of mass, and you can uh, predict what their motion should be. And so she had gotten a hold of this nice new telescope, you can see here, and she said, okay, I'm going to do that measurement, and we're going to show that, and I'll have a nice thesis to, to write up there. So she did it, and of course what happened is she was, was completely wrong. Uh, the stars on the outside of galaxies are moving nearly as fast as the ones on the inside. Very, very fast. And then she took a step forward. She said, well, you know, the only thing that I can think of that would explain that is if there's stuff in these galaxies that we don't see, much like this guy Sweetie had said many years earlier. There's stuff in there, and we, we don't know what it is. And so it got called dark matter. Better would have been to call it invisible matter. Uh, but it's basically, there's stuff there that we don't know what it is. And it's not a small amount. It's something like 85% or something of that. Uh, Galaxy is made up of dark matter, and we're clueless. We really don't know what dark matter is. But if you try to look at it all and understand from this and from dark energy what our universe is, you come up with exactly what you thought. It's a beer. Uh, there, there's our universe. Uh, the vast uh, majority of our universe there is stuff that we don't understand. Uh, some 95%. Most of it is uh, dark energy, the, the energy, when the park is energy and mass, the same thing. You can just convert, e equals mc squared allows you to convert between the two. 27% uh, or so is, is dark matter. And then even of that foam <laughs> that's at the top, most of it is sort of interstellar gas. We account for, you know, less than a percent or you know, like half of a percent or so. These are rough numbers. Uh, these numbers change occasionally from time to time, but roughly speaking, we're less than a percent uh, of, of our universe, uh, which is kind of a nice thing to think about, or not, it could be disturbing to some of you. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on some things, you know, how do you answer these questions? You know, what are ways that we can go about this? And, it, it's certain there, and, and in our experiment, there are several ways we think about this. Um, we have an open window, I like to call it different ways to open paths. One's an open window. This guy down here, he's our Higgs boson. Now what you know about the Higgs boson is that the Higgs boson interacts with anything that has mass. So one of the arrows on here, we, we've measured these other arrows, or we're measuring, in the process of measuring that. How much does the Higgs boson interact with these other particles? Well, essentially it decays, it transforms to these other particles. And we measure the standard model that we have that explains the um, the interactions between the particles tells us it should it should transform sometimes to two leptons or to to, to, to quarks, B quarks, 
uh, Z bosons, and we're, we're, we're just starting to get some precision on these measurements. This year, we're going to go to many, many more collisions. When we're going to shut down and change our accelerator to get maybe a factor of 10 or to 100 more collisions per second. And that will allow us to measure these numbers more precisely. But one of the things that, you know, if dark matter is indeed a fundamental particle uh, that we haven't seen, it's got to have mass. That's why it's affecting the galaxy. So, so it's possible, it's quite possible that we'll be able to start measuring, producing and measuring uh, dark matter. It's possible, we don't know. It has to fall into the right mass range. So we have these sort of, been, it's a new open window. The Higgs boson was really the beginning. It was the first thing that we found, but it's really finding it didn't complete anything. It just, it gave us some new tool that we can use to, to, to out and measure uh, and understand things more. And we have other open things. Uh, we have an open data. Uh, there's an open data portal uh, at CERN. CERN is publicly funded, and from the very, very beginning, 1954 is when CERN was put together, it was decided that all of our results need to be public, uh, and they are. We publish uh, absolutely everything. Recently, we've started to make more things public, so our data. You know, once, once we put the data in a form that's understandable, we put it out there, and you can get at it. You can get at different data sources. They show you there's different data sets, there's software to do uh, things with it, and they come from the different experiments. So there's, uh, there's more than a petabyte of data that's out there, which is, is actually still a small fraction of what we've got, but we put out uh, as, as much as we can. Um, this was, much was started by CMS. I give my colleagues a lot of uh, uh, credit for this. They put out some large raw data sets. On Atlas, we decided to, to focus on education. We've got some specific data sets with tools that allow you to, um, uh, to, to actually do things with classrooms, mainly, uh, mainly uh, undergraduate students. And, and you can actually, we have, we actually have my talk on this, but we, have, we can put ours on a key. And that's very useful because if we're doing education, we go to many places where network can be a challenge. Computing's a challenge, networking can be a challenge. You can go into a classroom and give them our data on a key. Um, so these are, this is, for example, um, I focused on Atlas because that's what I know about here, several of the different data sets that we put out there. One of the challenges we did, a uh, uh, company called Cadlum sponsors these things. We had a machine learning challenge, and this was really nice to see because my colleagues were sure that we were doing everything the best. We're, we're physicists, we're like that. And, um, and so we are using machine learning, we're using different uh, methods, but you know, when somebody, I think it was at uh, Orsay University, looked at this at the laboratory there, and they were from the world of computing like you guys, and they looked at it and they said, you guys are like you know, two decades behind, we can do better. And so we put up a challenge, and, uh, and of course the computing people did better. Uh, the challenge was to find um, the Higgs that came to tau leptons, because it's very uh, it's a very complex environment that you have to look at to pick out the signal from the background. Very, very complex. Uh, so that was, it was quite interesting for us. It helped us quite a bit. Um, so it's not just you know, for fun and education. It also uh, allowed us to do our work a little bit better. So we have data sets out there. Um, it just gives you uh, kind of a slightly, slightly low resolution version if you get a better image. But this shows you basically the tools that we give you. You can actually try making selection criteria. This is what we do. You might say, I want the photon to be a little bit more isolated or to have higher energy, and you can slide and make cuts on this and see how that affects your histograms and see how it affects your signal to background ratio. So you just play with this stuff, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and we also touch on open source. I don't know if you guys know anything about this, um, but we, we do touch a bit on this, about this. Um, I'm not the expert, but uh, CERN has an effort that's out there, and I think the one thing that they have that's, that's maybe slightly different than a lot of the efforts uh, is, uh, is this open hardware repository. So they put the source out for building and constructing different things, and, um, and that's made available. You can, you can find out how to construct, uh, you know, for example, there's White Rabbit, I know, which is a, a network. Um, that they've set up, and you can go and get the exact recipe for building anything you want there. It's all, it's all out there as open source. Uh, so this is, um, this is a major initiative of how you guys know most of the open software initiatives. 
Um, but you can, you're welcome to, to take a look at that. Uh, and you know, this, this, this helps us continue on our charge. Our charge in 1954 when CERN got founded was to do science for peace. Uh, it was a time after the war where we brought together scientists from all over the globe who had been in countries that had been fighting with each other and decided that we needed an open environment and that we pursued science uh, in the name of, of, of peace. And, and I think this openness in the environment of CERN uh, is, is trying to live up to that. Uh, here's, this is, there's also a listing of uh, the different uh, projects, it's easy to find, uh, the, the different projects that are, that are being done. There's an open hardware license, uh, I think they're version 1.2 now, uh, and, uh, and it's all described. I'm not going to go into any, any details on that. Finally, uh, to conclude, I'll, I'll mention the last thing that we have, which I think is perhaps one of the most important, is open minds. Uh, we get people from everywhere around the globe. And that was the original idea, and that's the idea that we're enforcing now. People from every place come, and we try to have as much diversity as possible. Uh, and we're still pursuing that. This is, this is just a map that shows all, all the colored countries there are, have representatives on the Atlas experiment. The blue countries are where they have institutes uh, that are working on it, and, and then the green countries add those countries where people are from. Um, I just want to sort of give you just a little perspective for it before I finish up here. This was an image taken uh, way back. You guys remember Voyagers? They went out in space. Uh, okay, uh, the Voyagers, the two Voyagers. Who remembers those things, those spaceships? I'm, I'm, I don't know. Okay, so they they went out. They did. They just reached the end of our solar system, right? And uh, we know that from measuring the amount of charged particle flux coming from the sun, etc. Uh, when it was, the further these voyagers, and they were built in the 70s, if I remember right, uh, as, it, as they were leaving, they had been designed to, to use energy from the sun to take photographs. And, and at the time, this was the high resolution photographs we got. Um, it was said, okay, well, it's now time to turn off the, the, the camera, because there's not enough power to keep doing this, and we want them to come send us data at very low rates, but the data is coming. And Carl Sagan said, okay, but I want you to take one last picture. And they took the Voyager and turned it around and had to take this one last picture. And if you look one grain on that picture up there at the top there, uh, that little tiny blue dot, that's us. Uh, and he wrote, I, I'm not going to quote him because he had such a beautiful, I, I challenge, go look it up, his quote was so beautiful. The gist of it was that, you know, this is the thing that we're fighting wars over, you know, a, a fraction of that grain. Uh, this is what, you know, their great leaders are, are, are arguing about. Uh, some of them want to build walls that would fit on one grain. You can't build a wall on one grain. Um, and his point was, you know, to sort of emphasize how insignificant we are actually out there in the universe. Uh, but it gives you a bit of freedom to realize that. And if you look at that, you might think, well, what's the point? You know, with this one tiny blue dot in, in surrounding one star, which is one of a hundred billion stars in one galaxy, which is one out of a hundred billion galaxies, is it really reasonable for us to think that we will ever be able to understand this universe. What I can say about my experiment uh, is that these people here, you see a variety of them, you can see their faces. Uh, these are my best friends, my 3,000 best friends on the documents uh, who work on this experiment, who came together from all over the place to build a device that's just incredibly complex. Uh, these people, um, and there's a, maybe perhaps our best image when we're celebrating the Higgs boson discovery. These people think we can, and I'm very happy to work with them. So, that's all I have to say. Thank you. So thank you very much. Do, do we have any questions for Steve? Anyone knows the quantum field theory of these? <laughs> <laughs> how many of uh, people working at CERN is engineers and how many is researchers?
part of it. Uh, the question was how many? Uh, how many of the people, uh, who big of a proportion of the people working in CERN is engineers and how many men are, them are researchers? Okay, so CERN's an interesting place. Um, there's roughly 2,500 people who work for CERN. Uh, they get a paycheck that has CERN on it. Okay? There's 2,500 people. There's 13 or maybe 14,000 now who work at CERN and are called users. I'm one of those. I'm a user. I work for the University of Melbourne, but at, at CERN. Um, they operate much like a like an airport, let's say. The airport, the, the infrastructure. So most of those 2,500 are not physicists. In fact, it's just a handful of physicists that, that actually work for CERN. Uh, most of them are engineers, or there's technicians as well, and support staff. So I don't really know the number exactly, but I, I could imagine that there are hundreds, if not a thousand, uh, engineers in the different areas. So there's a lot of mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, and there's software engineering that's, that's done there. Uh, so it's definitely a place to look for if you're interested uh, in finding a position. Uh, there are frequently positions going up for engineers to work uh, for CERN. Uh, and then in addition, at the institutions that work uh, there on the experiments, so we're, I'm there because I'm working on an experiment, and we use the facility. We're like, if that's an airport, we're kind of an airline, okay, we're a client, and we have our own structure. We organize together. Uh, there, there's plenty of engineers, but they're usually associated with the institutes that are in this collaboration. So our collaboration has uh, 38 countries, there's 180 institutes from around uh, the globe, and any of those need engineers to do the work to build the next thing. We're, we're building, always. <laughs> we're gonna, as I said, we're going to shut down at the end of this year and start installing new stuff and upgrading, and so there's engineers working. Hi, I was wondering if you can give us a specific example of the kind of research that one is doing at CERN in order to look for candidates for the dark matter. So, to look for dark matter, there's, there are different ways. Um, in general, uh, when you, I don't know if I have, if I go back to, that'd be complicated to get there. Okay, I'll go backwards fast. Show you one image, if I can find it. There is, there's an example image. So when there's a collision here, when there's a collision uh, of the two protons, there is, all the momentum is going like this. There's no transverse momentum, as we call it, transverse energy. So if you add up all of the tracks here, uh, you can get their momentum, and that should add up to zero. The vectors should add up to zero. And similar for the energy, there should be a balance of energy, overall energy. And so the first thing you just do is you look for events where there is an imbalance. You try to have something left, something went through the detector that we couldn't measure, we didn't measure. Now there can be reasons for that. It can be your detectors. Detectors are not perfect, but there's a very, very, they're pretty hermetic. So you don't lose very much there, and you can model that precisely. Um, you also know there are particles called neutrinos. Neutrinos pass through without us being able to measure them. Well, the standard model can model that. We know exactly our spectrum of missing energy, what it should look like. Uh, if you take and subtract that, and you still look at that plot, and you see that there's some peak somewhere, something where you have missing energy that adds up, for example, to the mass, uh, what you'd expect from the mass of a Higgs boson, that tells you you've got something. So in one sense, you just look. You look for missing energy. Uh, on the other hand, you can do something a little more sophisticated. There's models out there. There's actually a whole framework of, of um, theory that's called supersymmetry, which is a very fascinating idea. It's been out for decades now that uh, we've only really found half the particles. But for every one of the fermions, the matter particles, there's a boson, which is a four-string particle. And for every one of the bosons, there's a fermion. And so we've only found half the things. And, uh, and it, it's a model which would help bring in all the forces. 
uh, these things uh, predict that there should be particles out there which uh, are the, the, the most least massive particle which we won't see. And so uh, they, they give specific predictions depending on the exact model, on the exact theory. So it's a framework and there's a variety of different parameters in that framework. And essentially some people, what they do is they look at those and they, and they search for those specific signatures you know, images like this, they look for those, and when they don't see it, then you can eliminate that. And supersymmetry has had a lot of space eliminated. We're down to a little area where it can still exist, um, and we continue to look at that. So that's one of the more specific ways that you look for it. Do we have one last question? We have two. I will do those two, and that's... Can you explain briefly uh, what is in those images that you have? Oh, sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I should <laughs> I put this up here so you guys all know what it is. Um, so our uh, detectors are, are made up of, are, are very complex. So if I go back one, there's our detector. Uh, I don't have the image that shows what's inside, but there, there, there's a hundred million channels of information, more than a hundred million channels of information that comes from our detector. Um, so the one I can explain best is pretty much the same for the others. Atlas, at the very inside, you have uh, a lot of silicon, so you have pixels in there. We have about 80 million of our channels are in a, a cylinder on the very inside there. And uh, they're pixels which uh, ionize. So we use two things, we have two, two concepts you have to know to build a detector. One is that a charged particle will curve in a magnetic field. And the other is that there are certain materials which will ionize when a charged particle goes through, meaning that electrons will go one way and the ions will go another way. And so we use that. And uh, on the inside, we have a tracking chamber which uh, has a lot of chips in there, a lot of pixels. And when a, when a charged particle goes through, it lights them up. And we take the electrons out and we read that out. Okay, so we know that if something went through here, or something went through here or there. And when you see all of these dots, then we make pattern recognition software in 3D, which can make a track from them, or make the best possible track from all of the dots that are in there. Uh, those are the tracks you see. Also outside, like this big thing here that's being pushed in, um, that's a calorimeter. That stops particles uh, and measures energy. So it measures the energy of those particles. There's scintillator in there and other stuff which, which uh, the amount of light that comes out will tell you what the energy is of the particle that went into it. And then on the very outside, we have muon chambers because muons will go through that and they again ionize. They have a gas inside of a tube and a, and a wire and a high voltage, and so the electrons go to the wire. So you, you use ionization and you get a bunch of circles in this case, which you draw. The software makes a track through it, and then you get um, images like this. So this shows you. The tracks on the inside. So this is a proton's point of view. So a proton is going like this, and it sees its best friend explode in front of it. Uh, and and so you see that it produces many different. It, it might have produced something. In this case, uh, two of the gluons. Mo the most likely scenario for this image here is that two of the gluons, the things that hold together the quarks, interacted, and they produced uh, a, a quark, which then produced Higgs boson. And then that Higgs boson then also produced some quarks, which then gave us two Z bosons. I'm reading all of this from there. Which then decayed to four electrons, two pairs of electrons. So we know, you know, we have to go backwards. We do, we do sort of a, um, investigation from what we see on the outside to try to figure out the inside. It's the fun part of this. Heisenberg doesn't allow us into that middle part there. Uh, we, just, we will never be able to go there. There's a certain uncertainty that just we, we, no precise detector can get beyond. Uh, so we don't ever see really what happened at the center, but we investigate and we go backwards and we, and we, and we figure out. That's where we need the theorists. theorists. The theorists live in the center there. And they tell us this is what you can expect will happen. And we count. Essentially, all we do is we count. We count the, what comes out here, and it has to match with their theory. If it doesn't, they have to throw out their theory and come up with something else. Okay? Yeah, I, um, I was thinking about when, when you talked uh, 
about the machine learning part. That you had some other people, uh, computer scientists, that came in and helped you with the machine learning part uh -huh. to make it effective. So I was thinking if you need like image detection stuff or even more machine learning uh, uh, stuff for, for your research, do you have like a place online where people can go in and maybe try and help you out? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, much of this, that's why we do some of these sort of citizen science and, and why we put out the, the, the open, open data, uh, is there's tools there one can go and play around with it. Um, it it's, it's all public on our site, so for Atlas, it's simply opendata.atlas.cern. Um, and, uh, you know, people who are experts in machine learning, that, that's why we invited that partnership, but anybody who wants to try can go and try things out if they want to. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question or not. But, but do you have like um, a list of things that you, you need help with? A list of, li a wish list of things to get yeah, solved? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if you look at this image, uh, I'm guessing that you could do some pattern recognition software that could get all the conclusions automatically from the image. Yeah, so, so if you look at the... Well, uh, but that, that's essentially what we do. Okay. I mean, we, we do we do have we do have software engineers who help us out with this, and um, and yeah, it is it is being done with pattern recognition software. Um, and so yeah, that's that's how we figure out which tracks are belonging to, to, to which, which tracks. It's, it's the environment's even messier than this because as I mentioned, you know, we get like 25, 30, or 40 collisions each time. Each time we see one of those, if I turn this sideways you would see that there were many other collisions happening at the same time. And we have to actually not just match these tracks in this dimension, but we have to eliminate all the ones that were produced by the other collisions happening at the same time. So it's really, really a strong challenge. But there, there's always room for people to come and, and, and help and improve. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.